Hello, everybody. My name is Marlene Schuple. I'm one of the two guest curators who did the exhibition Hanna Feliger Amaze Me for the museum in Souche. And I'm happy to talk now about the fragmentary in the work of Hanna Feliger. What are fragments? Fragments are parts, remnants, they are piecework in the literal sense, pieces of a work. They refer to a whole that no longer exists as such. They are part of something that still awaits completion. The term fragment was originally applied to objects, stones or sculptures in the sense of a piece broken apart. However, a fragment can also be something open, unfinished, a work that has not yet been completed. The term is used with this connotation, especially in literature, and since the Romantic period, the fragment has become a true literary genre. The unfinished text is meant to inspire continued intellectual or literary work. Both meanings of the term, we could call it the un intended versus the intended fragments can be applied to Hanna Filiger's artistic practice and will serve me as a background against which to reflect on her work. The following thoughts refer mainly to the work based on Polaroid photographs and thus to Filiger's work from 1980 onwards. Although reference to her earlier works, namely the object of drawings produced in the 1970s and black and white photography, serve to anchor the theme in the beginning of Hanna Filiger's oeuvre. When the 23-year-old Hanna Filiger had her first solo ex exhibition in Zug in 1974, a reviewer wrote that her pictures were, quote, fragments, hints of an intense preoccupation with objects. A look at her early work reveals that the theme of the fragment was relevant even before her preoccupation with the body and her turn to photography. During, during her studies, in particular, during the stay in Canada in 1974, she was preoccupied with fragmentations carried out on plants, especially trees. She used a knife to cut off branches in larger and smaller pieces, which she then placed in the exhibition space, space for example here, her show in Toronto. The corresponding installation shots suggest a connection to the later body paintings based on formal similarities as well as cultural historical references. From mythology, spirituality or psychology, we are acquainted with analogies between trees and human life and bodies. Fragmented objects can also be found in her earlier drawings. Filiger dealt with pieces of wood in pen and watercolor, drawings of neatly lined up branch forks. She recorded the varying, the varying shapes in a kind of alphabet of forms. This real work was comparable to a research of these natural forms, just as she would later examine body parts in photographic series. The body in Filiger's photographic panels is never seen as a whole, which is due from a certain point onwards to a working method. This is apparent in the peri period starting from 1983, when the artist worked almost entirely with her own body, which is the central subject of the picture. However, in the Polaroid photographs taken by her, by her own hand, only a part, a fragment, can be depicted. What is missing is, at the very least, the hand guiding the camera. Somewhere, this hand or the whole arm or upper body is cut off by the edge of the picture. 
The body is this partly inside and partly outside the pictorial space. And the artist is thus both the invisible, invisible subject and the visible object. The artist places little emphasis on the unity of the body and creates an index of fragments. David Levi Strauss aptly explained. She often pushed this game so far that the viewer is unable to reconstruct the body as a whole. But we know that there is a continuum even if we cannot recognize it. We have this certainty because we sense that the images are of a living body. We see reddened areas of skin, goosebumps, tense muscles and tendons. And in some images we can detect movement. Life pulsates in these limbs. We find a contract, contrast to this in Hans Bellmer, who at the beginning of the 20th century attracted attention with his surrealistic imagery. He arranged and photographed arms, legs, or the torse, torso of a puppy, inanimated body fragments that do not form a whole, but are nevertheless formally quite comparable with Hamnafiliger's body elements. One of the fascinating things about Filiger's body images is that they address far more than just our eyes, but rather the whole body as one large sensory organ. We as viewers are more than intellect. In dialogue with the work of Hannah Filiger, we are above all emotion and body. The images are disturbing. They speak directly to our feelings as well as through our own physicality. We try to trace the posture of the body depicted to figure out how the knotting of the limbs is possible. We are even tempted to recreate the positions. In principle, our own body would be capable of adopting the posture of the model. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes it's so complex that we fail. And this failure fascinates and impresses us. But it also leads to an alienation when it is not possible to make the connection between the depicted body and one's own body. The complex processes of fragmenting as part of the compositional decisions take the image body out of the realm of familiar, familiar body perception and transfer it into spheres to which we find access through the sensual body perception. The desire, the erotic charge, acts like a powerful pull. In Filiger's imagery, we encounter sensuality in all its, its complexity of attraction and repulsion, pleasure and pain, loneliness and closeness. In the early days of photography, Photographers made the endeavor to assimilate their works to painting in order to gain the same recognition as the highly esteemed painters of the time. However, they also introduced new creative elements through their pictorial medium, which in turn increasingly influenced painting and drawing of the late 19th century. Part of the photographic aesthetic was, among other things, the radicality of the cropping of the image, with which one could cut out a piece of visible reality without further ado. This led to a decontextualization of the motif and strengthens awareness that the image always represents a section and thus a fragment of reality. With regards to Filiger's work, this draws our attention to the edge of the picture, to the fragmentation cut with which the pictorial field is limited. 
The edges of the images become all the more important because the Polaroid process produces a very specific, almost square image section. And thus, this squint distinguishes itself in terms of our habits of seeing photography determined by the rectangle. The artist used this format preliminarily as can be seen in the first Polaroid works from 1980. Of her own face, for example, the image detail reveals only the mouth and the shadow of the nose. In the photograph of her lover, the décolleté and arms appear with the, within the picture frame, while the head and lower body lie separated outside. These examples are representative of a type of image composition that never shows a whole. The camera moves in close. As a result, much disappears from view, which could be as a symbol of the intimacy between the women, the physical closeness between the two lovers. Here, the camera is also passed back and forth. In some cases, Philippe is only a model, leaving the role of the photographer to her partner. Their state of togetherness is also emphasized by a formal alignment that almost makes them twins. For instance, two photos each show their tanned bodies in bikini bottoms. With a cigarette in their right hand, they lie on the bed, heads and legs missing. The fragmentation not only makes them confusingly similar, but also elevates the anecdotal, anecdotal nature of the intimate moment to a broader scope. A work created around the same time, also in two parts, even leads to a merging of the two bodies across the picture panels, since one leg of each of the two women is in one of the same pair of green trousers as if they belonged to the same body. Each body fragment finds its counterpart in the other. It complete, is completed by it. It's a game of ambiguity, of showing and omitting, seducing and concealing. In the later works as well, the edge of the picture cuts into the motif, divides the foot in two, separates the shoulder, decapitates the torso. This somewhat martial terminology is in keeping with the intense effect the filigree's photo aesthetic settings can exert. She makes it clear to where she wishes to direct the viewer's gaze and that her own body is the material with which she can work in all freedom and radicality. In 1988, Filiger assembled Polaroid images into groups for the first time, which she called blocks. The following year, she had the opportunity to show block number one in the legendary large-scale exhibition Bilderstreit in Cologne. By cutting the photographic edges of the picture, open margins emerge that can connect with the adjoining pictorial space. With the blocks, the artist was concerned with forming a new unity. In her workbooks, there are many drawings with possible compositions, which she played through. In total, Filiger created roughly 100 blocks, consisting of two to 20 individual images. In order to find a coherent transition between the shots, the artist turned the Polaroids in all directions and led them out in a geometric grid with small distance between them. In this way, new bodies emerge from the body fragment. What had been amputated is supplemented by another body part on the next panel. This is masterfully achieved in this block, where, for example, a um, cut-off shoulder section is continued in arms and legs on the next photograph. All six panels combine to form something new. 
Here, body parts explicitly become sculptural material and part of a larger whole. In this work, the fragments of the woman's body become a new being. During our conceptual work on the exhibition of them at the Museum Souche, we call this block the animal. We saw in it as kind of a strange animal with the energetic body that moves in a crouching posture in a black space. Through the block of pictures, the body experiences an expansion, new possibilities present themselves. Formulated here are perhaps longings for a new whole, for an openness of ideas of the female body and of traditional demands on its representation. The fragmentation in Filiger's Polaroid photographs is, as mentioned above, linked to the close-up view. The eye of the camera is always so close that we only see a fragment. The photographer cannot step back at a distance. There is no more than an arm's length between the camera and the subject. This closeness is paired with spatial narrowness, with the concentration of the body to the depicted in a very tight portion of space. The photographer seems to squeeze the body into, ge into a ge geometric frame, the almost square picture format of the Polaroid. The frame opens onto the pictorial space, which often seems to be no more than one or two cubic meters. It is cramped. The photos were taken in a small space in a corner of her workroom. The artist was dedicated to the representation of the outside world, not only with her early work, but also selectively in her later Polaroid pieces. When she turned her camera outwards, she did so with the pan shot, moving away from the corner where she worked and towards the window and the city in front of the house. She photographed the view from a studio room in Paris and Basel, where she mainly lived. Filiger did not immerse herself in the city, but remained in the position of an observer. Once again, she used a serial approach, working on individual motifs, such as the immense treetop that unfolds its splendor in the front of her window in Basel. Like her own freckled skin, she scanned the surface of the speckled ball of leaves with her camera. And as with her own body, we never see the crown of the tree in its totality. The mystery of this sensual natural phenomenon remains the artist did not want to tell the story to its end. The cityscapes also include sweeping views upwards over the Paris rooftop landscape, or the steep view downwards to the urban rear country yard. Filiger created cityscapes that are not oriented to the horizontal. She turned the images or the camera in all directions, upsetting certainties of above and below or of the laws of gravity. The built urban fabric tilts, slides, and becomes a moving body. Quote, city, body, body, city, the artist noted in her workbook in 1990. In the tradition of self-portraiture, the mirror has served as a tool for the most lifelike self-portrait possible. Painters position a mirror next to their easel with the reflection serving as a model. In contrast, Filiger used the mirror with the opposite intention. In her work, mirrors are compositional elements within the pictorial space and do not serve as a reproduction that is as close to nature as possible, but rather a condensation of the composition and a heightening of the pictorial effect. The artist sat on mirrors, stood in front of mirrored surfaces, 
or uses fragments of mirrors which she positioned within the pictorial space by holding them in her hand. The complexity of this composition can almost cause the viewer to feel dizzy. Spatial orientation is prevented by the multiplication of lines of sight. The continuum of spatial depth is fragmented. The pictorial elements break on sharp edges. The body parts can hardly be mentally brought back together again. As in Cubist painting in the 1910s, the result is a polyperspectival and fragmented view of the pictorial elements of body parts or props, such as fabrics, jewelry, and glasses. A comparison with Woman with the Mandolin by George Brock of 1910 reveals clear parallels. However, the painter pushed the crystalline pictorial elements even further towards abstraction with the help of a neutralizing color scheme. Billiger was simultaneously a model and a photographer. Therefore, her works are in fact self-portraits. On a content level, however, they cannot be understood as such. Too much in Filiger's work deviates from the canon of the self-portrait. There is no eye contact with the viewer, no psychological self-exploration, no will to self-representation. The artist worked as a researcher on her own body, which was the object of investigation, the tool and the material available to her on a daily basis. She dealt with the material uncompromisingly. She, quote, used it and, quote, squeezed something out of it. There is not a glimpse of exploration of her own personality either. Although in 1990 she wrote in her workbook, quote, one strives to express a sense of one's inner self. Still, the impression remains that she avoided telling us about herself as a person. This may seem surprising since she depicted herself in hundreds of pictures, almost always naked and in front of the large format works, the viewer comes very close to this exposed body. For Filiger, however, nudity does not seem to be necessarily linked to intimacy. For example, when she says that she perceived the skin like a dress and that she did not feel as if she was exposed or naked. Nor does the artist convey hypothetical insights into her inner self by slipping, slipping into roles. This is also the key difference to Cindy Sherman, for example, and her staged photography. Filiger's pictures do not create a reproduction of an extra pictorial reality. Staging, composition, lightning, and fragmentation result in a construction and not an objectifying image. If we consider Filiger's oeuvre, as a whole, and focus in particular on its end, we must conclude that it, too, is inherently fragmentary, if only because of her, her untimely death. Her work came to a sudden end. It was not completed. It is a fragment in the literary sense, a kind of torso that could be thought further without knowing in which direction it might have developed. The only thing that seems difficult to imagine is that Filiger would not have continued to work with her own body in one way or another. In the year before Filiger's death, three blocks were created in which one cannot recognize any body parts. Instead, we look into a parent jumble of brightly colored fabrics, gathered, rolled, cast off, folded. The body withdrawals while simultaneously color emerges. 
This happens with a force that overwhelms. There are color explosions dominated by strong red and complemented by shades of yellow, blue and white. Although the body itself is not depicted, it is indirectly present. In red, the color of blood and flesh. The view seems to penetrate the inside of the body and openings lead our gaze into the depth of the fabric of the body. At the same time, the vibrating shades of red speak of eroticism and the textiles are arranged into shapes reminiscent of the female sex. The fabrics are at least partially recognizable as articles of clothing. This is the motive of undressing and also leads back to eroticism and makes us think of Wolfgang Tillmann's photographs, for instance, of striped garments. Yet, we cannot avoid looking at this group of works under the aspect of transition, the vanishing of the body. For her last large work, a nine-part block of images, Filiger combined the theme of the fabrics with her own body. She slipped into and under the colored textiles. Fragments of an arm or leg emerge. Red is the spatial bracket that frames the body with the red background and the corresponding headscarf. The later a new element in her imagery. Filiger's work broke off prematurely, although with something new. Thank you.